Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a box to die for. I mean, it's either you either are going to want it so much you're ready to die, or it's going to kill you when you listen to it. It is the complete, well, it's not the complete, but it's the Max Rager Orchestral Edition, which is not entirely orchestral. It's mostly orchestral. You've got all kinds of stuff in here. It's 12 CDs on Deutsche Grammophon. Now, this is one of those boxes that consists primarily of material licensed from Koch, or Koch, as we used to call it in the U.S. Um, it was like their their Strauss box, the un unknown Strauss box that they put out. They had this stuff. So it's not entirely DG stuff, and it's not entirely what we might call the highest and the best conductors and orchestras, although they're pretty good. They really are. And this is mostly very, very decent. There are better individual recordings of most of the stuff in here. But, uh, you know, for what it is, it's, it's well, let, let me put it this way. There are two ways of looking at it. One way is the cup is half full. You can say, well, these are thoroughly professional, well-recorded performances of a lot of rarely heard music. And that would be very true. Or you can take the position that the cup, cup is half empty and say, well, Rager is a complicated and difficult composer who needs absolutely sterling, astonishing, thrilling, stunning, perfect, exalted standards of conducting and playing in order to present the music at its best because it does not play itself, which means that a lot of this will be a slog. Well, the truth is that both are true, depending on, on your perspective and your tolerance. So let's just go through this and see what's in here. And then we can, we can take it uh, as it comes and you can make up your mind whether you want it or not. It's inexpensive, by the way. It's like 40 bucks or something or somewhere in there. And, and it's still around, which is like shocking, given who, who we're dealing with here, don't you think? So Rager lived from 1873 to 1916, not too long, but he was unbelievably prolific. He just wrote and wrote and wrote tons of stuff, unbelievable quantities of stuff, chamber music, organ music, piano music, and indeed quite a bit of orchestral music, but that was never regarded as his forte. Some of you have pointed out that his best works are chamber works, and that's probably true because when he was dealing with smaller forces, um, the, the, the textures would naturally be less thick and clogged. See, the problem with a composer like Rager is that he was basically a contrapuntist. That is, he dealt with simultaneously moving melodic lines. And the trouble with orchestral counterpoint is that most of the orchestra is not going to be doing anything to do with the counterpoint. In other words, you can't have a huge orchestra and have like two or three parts only. There are all those other instruments out there looking for things to do, which means they're going to be fillers. And that filler can overwhelm the clarity the clarity of line, of musical argument. And that was essentially Rager's problem. In his best works, he got past it. And in his less contrapuntal stuff, he actually proved to be an orchestrator of, of considerable ability. But when he was dealing with his primary interest, which was, you know, contrapuntal writing, he had problems in figuring out what to do with those instruments. And there was no way around it. There just wasn't. So some of his music sounds a lot better than other of his music orchestrally. So let's see what we have here. First, we have the prologue, symphonic prologue to a tragedy. Now, thank God he never wrote the tragedy. The symphonic prologue to a tragedy is 33 minutes long. A single 33 minute prologue. <laughs> It only leads one to wonder how long the tragedy would have been had it not been for this 33 minute long prologue. It's actually rather fun, but it is long. Oh my God, it's long. It's kind of like a Liszt symphonic poem, like Ce qu'on entend sur la montagne, which is also 33 minutes. And Tovey described it as an introduction to an introduction to a connecting link to a series of more introductory phrases to a melody, to a recapitulation of all the previous introductions. I mean, that's kind of what it's like. It, 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 the form is a little hard to grasp, but moment by moment, it's, it's, it's lovely and it's an unwritten tragedy. So it's very germ 
me. It's dark, it's gloomy, it's heavy, it's turbulent, it's agitated, it's full of, of angst and Weltschmerz and Leidenschaft and all of those terrific German terms. You just, you know, what else do you want? It's, it's, it's the thing. So there's that. And then we have two romances for violin and orchestra. Opus 50, numbers one and two. These are like the Beethoven romances. They're charming, they're tuneful, they're not too gloppy, they're nice, they really are. And the performance is here with the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra of Berlin under Gerrit Albrecht, who's usually very reliable in the, in the prelude or prologue, or whatever that thing is. And Oros Lajowicz in the second thing with Hans Miley. Violin. I don't care who these people are. They do fine. Then we've got the Romantic Suite after poems by Eichendorf. And it's another, well, it's, it's even longer. No, it's not. It's about, it's about, let's see, 18 and 18, 27 minutes in three movements. A nocturne, a scherzo, and a finale, which is long and slow and dark and very German and undoubtedly about death and, and nocturnal things. Uh, this is one of his more thickly scored and I think less memorable pieces, however romantic it's supposed to be. It, it, it comes across in my mind as just kind of heavy, but you know, Rigor was a heavy guy. Then we have one of his masterpieces, the four symphonic poems after Arnold Berklin. What a fabulous piece. And I've come back to this many times because it really is his orchestral masterpiece and it's been marvelously recorded many times. And this is also Gerd Albrecht with the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra Berlin. It's good performances. The three, the three tone poems, once again, are the, the violin playing Hermit and the play of the waves and the, the Isle of the Dead of Rachmaninoff tone poem fame. And then finally, a Bacchanal. And this is, this is very well scored, evocative music that's extremely, extremely lovely and true to its subject, which just goes to show that when Rager was not dedicated to being as contrapuntally serious as possible, he could actually write some really good music. He did some very good contrapuntal music too. Don't get me wrong. I don't want all you Rager guys, particularly the organ people, to jump up and down and scream, but there's the, uh, you know, okay, I agree with you. He wrote the, uh, and it's a masterpiece. Next, Variations and Fugue on a theme by Hiller. This is one of his best sets of variations because it's kind of light in tone and texture, and it's a nice tune. So that's delightful. There's a whole bunch of, well, you'll see, of variations things. He did Mozart variations, Beethoven variations, Hiller, Telemann, Bach, you name it, he wrote variations. And these are some of the pieces that caused him some of the most problems, with one exception, which we'll get to anon. Then the ballet suite, he wrote a piece called a ballet suite. If there was anybody who was less danceable than Rager, I have no idea who that was. But here we have a dance suite with an entree and Columbine and Harlequin and Piero. It's Commedia dell'arte dance suite. And if there's anybody who is less Commedia or Del Arte than Rager, I have no idea. But he tried and it came off fairly well. This is Horst Stein with the Bamberg Symphony. And now we've got two more sets of variations, the Mozart variations and the Beethoven variations in the version for orchestra, which as one of you pointed out is substantially different and rather recomposed from the version for two pianos. But it's still, it's, it's a lovely work and it's perfectly fine. And this is also the Bamberg Symphony under Horst Stein. And you know, you just deal with some of those thick clotted textures that he loved. You put up with it because the music's good music. It really is good music. And the variations are clever and fun to follow. Then we have his suite in the olden style in F major. You have a prelude, a largo, and of course, a fugue. You've got to have a fugue. And the olden style is, well, I keep saying it, it's Rager. It's somewhat turgid and heavy and not quite as contrapuntally luminous as the olden style real folk did it, but it's not bad. And then we have the Serenade in G major, which is really rather pretty. And he has a vivace a burlesca. Rager was a funny guy in real life. His music just wasn't too funny. You know, he wrote one of the all-time greatest replies to a critic. You know, it's, it's absolutely famous. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the smallest room in my house. 
I have my review before me, your review before me. In a moment, it will be behind me. That was his review. It was, it was, ich sitze in, in, in das kleinste Raum meiner Haus. Ich habe you know, dein Kritik vor mir in einem Moment. Würde es nach mir or something. I don't know. It was something like that. Hinter mir. Hint, it was be, you know what room it was and where it was going. That's the point. And the serenade is really quite charming. And he also actually marks the third movement, Andante Simplice, Sostenuto, Ni Schleppend, meaning don't schlep, don't drag it. It was one of Mahler's favorite comments, Ni Schleppend, don't drag. And that's the biggest problem in Rager performance, the tendency to schlep. And the reason you want to schlep is because there are just so many notes that they tend to slow down whatever tempo you're at. So the nicht schleppend indication is quite salutary in explaining how Rager really wanted this stuff played. So this is also Horstein, as we said. Then there's the concerto in the olden style, which is a little like Vivaldi concerto, only twice as long, or a Bach concerto, which is a little bit more like it. And the Sinfonietta in A major, which is his opus 90. Now, it's very interesting to compare the Sinfonietta with the Serenade, because the Sinfonietta, I think, has real problems of orchestration. It is a truly heavy-duty piece in terms of sound and trying to have it come across clearly. While by the time he got to the Serenade, which is only five opi later, which means he probably wrote it like at lunchtime on the same day that he wrote the Sinfonietta, given how prolific he was, um, he seems to have gotten more the hang of dealing with the orchestra and, and writing with more clarity. And it was only his Opus 90. It only took him that long to get there. But he got there. And then we have, oh, would you know this? This is hilarious. Oh, he, I mean, what's hilarious is the fact that it exists. It's called a comedy overture. Can you believe he wrote a comedy overture? Rager, of all people, a comedy overture? Well, like most of these pieces, it's kind of similar to the, the prologue to an unwritten tragedy, except it's a comedy. So, you know, maybe the subtitle would be like Death at the Circus. But it's still, I mean, you know, who, comedy? Who are we kidding? Oh, my God. Then there's the Symphonic Rhapsody for Violin and Orchestra, which is 23 minutes of, it's arranged by Florizel von Reuter after Rager's Fragment. So whatever the result is, it's not Rager's fault. And that's all you need to know. Then we have the Suite for Violin and Orchestra in A minor, which is arranged for violin and orchestra by Adelbart Baranski from Rager's Six Fortrogs Stücke Suite for Violin and Piano. And that's, you know, that's nice. It's cute. It's, it's adorable. And the Scherzino for Horn and String Orchestra, it's a Scherzino. It's only two minutes and 42 seconds long, and it's very fast. It's marked as sehr schnell. And the faster, the better. And now we have CD8, his piano concerto, Oh, I have to say, I, I, I did a talk on his piano concerto. You can go look at it. Uh, the two worst German piano concertos ever in the history of humanity, or actually the two worst piano concertos in the history of humanity, which both happen to be German, one of which is Fitzner, and the other is Rager. Now, it really depends on the performance because Rudolf Serkin managed to get through it. Mark andre Hamelin managed to get through it. And this recording is with Gerhard Oppitz, and he gets through it. It's not too slow. That's the point, because the first movement here is 18 minutes long. The slow movement, Largo con gran espressioni, Rager writes somewhat hopefully, um, is 11 minutes and 44 seconds, but it's the finale that gets you. The finale is, is, in this case, 9 minutes and 10 seconds, and that's about right. It should be 8 or 9 minutes. I mean, there was that other recording that's in, you know, there's a Brilliant Classics Weber, I mean, Rager box that has a lot of the same stuff. The Brilliant Classics has the Berlin Classics stuff, and this has the Koch stuff. It's like, you know, the people were licensing this and, you know, from wherever they could grab it and stuff it in. And that one has the amazing German, German pianist Amadeus Weberzinka is his name or something like that. And, oh, it's, it takes 12 minutes over the finale. It's just, oh, it's lethal. It's 
deathly. Oh, it's just awful. But in, in these Tempe, the piece stands a chance of not being as bad as it usually sounds. It's not a great work. Let's not kid ourselves. CD9, the Violin Concerto. Now, the Violin Concerto is even longer than the Piano Concerto. It's 54 minutes long in three enormous movements. Here we have Walter Forcher, the intrepid violinist, with the Bamberg Symphony under Horst Stein. And it's a miracle they survive, and it will be a miracle if you survive too. I mean, the piece is just a blasted ordeal. Let's, okay. Then we have this piece called Requiem for alto, solo, chorus, and orchestra. It's only 15 minutes long. And then there's a Requiem fragment for four soloists, chorus, orchestra, and organ, where you get the Requiem and Kyrie and the Dies Irae. And those two fragments total 35 minutes. I mean, so even when he's, he's doing a fragment, it's a big Gesunta fragment. It's not your little tiny fragmentary fragment. It's a big, hefty chunk of a fragment. And, you know, I, I have no patience for that stuff, but you may. And then there's the Gesang der Verklärten, the chant of the transfigured which is only 17 minutes and 35 seconds long. I mean, how long does it take you to transfigure? Usually, the shorter amount of time it takes to transfigure, the better off you're going to be, I would think, once you finally get to the transfiguration part. And then we have Die Weihe der Nacht, the consecration of the night for alto solo male chorus and orchestra, and Psalm 100 for chorus, orchestra, and organ. And then the, the Via Gesang, the Song of Consecration. Um, and these are, these are occasional pieces. This is all with the Bamberg Symphony under Horst Stein or the NDR Symphony under Roland Bader. And then we have the Nuns for Chorus and Orchestra. Now this, this sucker is 28 minutes and 45 seconds. And I tried to listen to it several times. I finally did get through it. I really did. And it's about nuns. That's all I know, and I have no desire to know more. And then a bunch of orchestral songs. Actually, the orchestral songs are not bad. Some of them are actually lovely. Most of them are quite brief. I'm looking at these things and I'm seeing two minutes, 37 seconds, one minute, 53 seconds. Oh, thank goodness. Yes, there is, there is a Rager who is terse and concise and pointed. Yes, it exists. He had that gift. He could do it when he wanted to. Actually, he does it quite frequently also in his piano works, many of which are absolutely lovely. We have to talk about that because there's a, there's a big set of his complete piano works and it's really good stuff. There's really a lot of good stuff in there. He was a wonderful keyboard, keyboard composer. So this may not be the greatest of everything Rager did, but it's a lot of, there's a lot of good music. And if you don't take it too seriously and treat it with an open mind, and I mean, I know he wanted you to take it too seriously, but th that doesn't matter. At heart, he was a sweet and happy person. And I think we should keep that in mind when we listen to his music, no matter how relentlessly turgid it becomes. And with that, I leave it to you to decide if this is in your wheelhouse. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.